in our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, December 13. President Sagyal oversees the signing of three memorandums of understanding at Dutch tech company ASML earlier on Tuesday amid plans to establish a chip alliance with the Netherlands. And the government here unveils a financial package worth some 38 trillion won over the course of five years to boost Korea's rechargeable battery market amid fierce competition over supply chains. Elsewhere, U.S. President Joe Biden shares his frustration over the fate of Israel's counter-offensive campaign in Gaza as its rampant bombing of the region undermines global support for its cause. We start with news of tangible statements of joint intentions by Korea and the Netherlands to expand chip collaboration that were inked on Tuesday. Our senior correspondent Oh Soo-young reports from Amsterdam. South Korean and Dutch chip giants will jointly invest over $700 million to foster next-generation semiconductor technology and young specialists, as President Yoon Seo-go aims to solidify a semiconductor alliance with the Netherlands. On Tuesday, the South Korean leader visited the production facility of ASML, the world's biggest supplier of lithography machines, crucial for making semiconductors. Accompanied by Dutch King Willem Alexander and the heads of Samsung and SK Hynix, Lee Jae-yong and Chet Tae-won, Yoon oversaw the signing of three memorandums of understanding on developing cutting-edge microchips, which make up almost 20% of South Korea's exports. ASML is made of the advanced 인공지능, 5G, 모빌리티 등 4차 산업 혁명의 강력한 동력이 되고 있습니다. 앞으로 한국 기업들과 긴밀히 협력해서 반도체 산업의 혁신과 글로벌 공급망 안정화를 위해 노력해 주시기를 기대합니다. Samsung and ASML agreed to jointly invest some 763 million US dollars into an R&D center based in South Korea to develop ultra-fine processing technology based on next-generation extreme ultraviolet or EUV lithography. Meanwhile, SK Hynix also signed a deal with ASML to co-develop hydrogen recovery technology for EUVs, recycling rather than burning hydrogen to use as process gas. This is expected to reduce power usage by around 20% and save $12.5 billion in costs annually. Another MOU was reached between the Korean and Dutch governments to establish a chip academy for graduate students beginning in February, involving the two nations' top chip-related firms and institutions, including Samsung and ASML, to offer practical training with cutting-edge equipment and facilities. Growing talent together and sharing know-how is something that only a true semiconductor alliance can do, and we expect that exchanges between future generations in the industry will become more active. Yun's economic secretary noted that the deals were inked as global foundries like Samsung, TSMC and Intel scrambled to master the production of ultra-fine 2 nanometer chips, around 10 to 15 times faster than 3 nanometer models, which were first mass-produced last year by Samsung. As their rivalry intensifies, he noted that the president toured ASML's clean room facility, featuring an advanced lithography machine which has never been shown publicly before. This, he said, casts optimistic prospects for South Korean firms looking to secure key materials and equipment to boost their chip-making capacity. Celebrating the budding cooperation, the South Korean leader and the Dutch king both signed a semiconductor wafer for display at the clean room facility. President Yu will further discuss strengthening bilateral chip cooperation with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte when they meet at The Hague on Wednesday. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News, Amsterdam. Right, and prior to that summit scheduled for this Wednesday, President Yoon suk yeol and Dutch King Wilhelm Alexander reaffirmed the cordial friendship shared by the two countries at a state banquet on Tuesday. Our presidential correspondent Kim do reports. At the first state banquet for a South Korean president at the Royal Palace of Amsterdam on Tuesday, President Yoon Song yeol gave a special shout out to the Dutchman that brought a special moment to all Koreans in recent history.
This was his way of showing that South Korea and the Netherlands share a deep relationship that goes beyond semiconductor cooperation. The diplomatic relationship was established more than 60 years ago, and the two countries last year upgraded the relationship to a strategic partnership. Also, he reminded everyone that the first Westerner to become naturalized to what at the time was the Joseon dynasty was a Dutchman Yan Yan's Beltebri, or in Korean, Pagyon. King Willem Alexander also noted that South Korea has grown tremendously in just a couple of years, and Koreans and the Dutch are culturally connected. The Republic of Korea is everywhere. There's K-pop on the radio, K-movies in the cinema, K-dramas on Netflix, and K-food in the supermarket. Above all, the two leaders underscore the shared values that the two countries are based on, something that has become increasingly important with uncertainties around the world. Global this comes as President Yoon started official engagements for the state visit on Tuesday at the welcoming ceremony at Dam Square in Amsterdam, which included a 21 gun salute and a greeting from Korean children. After heading inside the palace, the President and the Dutch King introduced their delegations, including Prime Minister Mark Ruda. Prime Minister Ruta, according to President Yoon himself, is one of the leaders most close to him on the global scene. And Yoon was accompanied by Ruta as he went to lay a wreath at the National Monument at the dam to commemorate the Dutch war heroes. There, President Yoon thanked the king for his hospitality, saying his state visit to South Korea in 2014, a first for a Dutch king, boosted the bilateral relationship back then. And his visit to the Netherlands is another milestone. Kim Doya, Arirang News. Here at home, Economy and Finance Minister Chu Gyeong ho has pledged some 38 trillion won for Korea's rechargeable battery market over the course of five years to sharpen its competitive edge amid concerns over supply chains. Our An Sung Jin explains. The South Korean government plans to inject some 29 billion U.S. dollars into the rechargeable battery industry over the space of five years from 2024. Yeah. Finance Minister Chu kyung ho in an emergency economic meeting on Wednesday discussed ways to enhance industrial competitiveness in the rechargeable battery industry. We plan to actively support facility investment in promising rechargeable battery companies and to develop core technologies such as all solid state batteries. We will also shorten the patent examination period from the current 21 months to 10 months by prioritizing rechargeable battery patents. It also plans to foster an ecosystem for recycled batteries in order to reduce dependency on critical raw material supplies from abroad. Instead of treating used batteries as waste, the plan is to transform them into recyclable products if they meet the criteria. If recycled, some can be remanufactured for electric vehicles, while those that are difficult to reuse will be recycled by extracting only valuable metals such as lithium and nickel. The government estimated that if all used batteries were recycled, it would secure enough key minerals for 170,000 electric vehicles annually, which is half of what Hyundai and Kia produce in a year. To further stabilize the supply chain, the government will increase loans for related companies and support interest rate reductions for facility investment in North America in response to the Inflation Reduction Act. To support critical raw material reserves and prevent a supply chain crisis in the long term, it plans to invest in building storage facilities by 2026 to store lithium, cobalt and other vital raw materials for rechargeable batteries. At the meeting, measures to combat shrinkflation or package downsizing were also discussed. Data from the Korea Consumer Agency found that nearly 40 items have been downsized over the past one year. The government will seek to make it necessary for sellers to show any dosage changes on product packaging and for them to indicate the unit price. It will become mandatory to label any changes on goods. We plan to thoroughly check whether this is properly implemented through consumer agencies or reporting centers. The government also pledged to pay close attention to inflation and amend relevant regulations if necessary. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Also on the local front, employment expanded in November as well, albeit at a smaller size on month. Our Park Kono covers the latest numbers. 
South Korea's employment figures rose once again last month, but with a smaller increase in October. According to Statistics Korea on Wednesday, 277,000 jobs were added on year in November, bringing the total number of workers aged 15 and over to some 28 million 600,000. By industry, employment numbers were added especially in the science, health and welfare and IT sectors, and by age, those aged 60 and above and people in their 30s and 50s attributed to the increasing figures. But figures for other sectors including education and real estate all fell. Job additions have been on the increase from July, reaching a peak of 346,000 new jobs on year in October. But additions dropped last month, with fewer jobs in the accommodation and food service sector, which fell 50,000 in October to less than 10,000 last month. Statistics Korea also said the slower pace of increasing jobs was due to the base effect as employment soared after the easing of COVID-19 measures. Manufacturing jobs have fallen for 11 straight months since January, with a decrease of 110,000 workers last month, which also contributed to November's smaller increase. Last month's employment rate of 63.1 percent was an all-time high for any November since records were first compiled in 1982. An official from Statistics Korea said that the increasing demand for babysitters after COVID-19 boosted the employment rate, especially among women in their 50s. In terms of the unemployment figures, there was a drop for people in their 20s and a rise for those in their 50s, with the total remaining at 2.3 percent, the same as last November. Park Geun-hye. Arirang News. U.S. President Joe Biden has shared his frustration over the fate of Israel's counter-offensive campaign in Gaza as its rampant bombing of the region undermines global support for its cause. Our Lee Seung jae has the latest. U.S. President Joe Biden has warned Israel that it's losing global support over its indiscriminate bombing of Gaza. He also called on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to change his way of dealing with the armed conflict, showing a new rift in his relationship with the Israeli leader. Speaking to Democratic donors in Washington on Tuesday, Biden voiced criticism of Israel's hardline government, calling Netanyahu's government the most conservative government in Israel's history. The Israeli Prime Minister admitted Tuesday that there is a disagreement with Biden regarding what he referred to as the post-Hamas Gaza Strip, but expressed hope that the two sides could reach an agreement. Netanyahu is against Biden's idea to allow the Palestinian Authority to govern the Gaza Strip following the end of the armed conflict, while the U.S. leader also pushing for a two-state solution. Netanyahu argues that Israel doesn't want to see a repeat of the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians in the 1990s, a deal that included a limited right to self-determination in Gaza and the West Bank. The chief of the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, Philippe Lazzarini, visited Gaza on Tuesday to examine the humanitarian situation in the region. Describing the visit, he said it was hell on earth and called for an immediate ceasefire. Meanwhile, Reuters reported Tuesday that they are 135 hostages still being held captive by Hamas. According to the Israeli government, of the 135 held captive, 19 are presumed to have been killed. The UN General Assembly on Tuesday voted to demand an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in the armed conflict. A majority of 153 nations voted in favor of a ceasefire resolution in the General Assembly's emergency special session while 10 voted against and 23 abstained. The non-binding resolution calls for a ceasefire for all parties to comply with international law and for humanitarian access to hostages as well as their immediate and unconditional release. Lee seung Arirang News. And staying in the U.S., Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with lawmakers from across the aisle and President Joe Biden in hopes of ensuring continued U.S. support for his country's defense against Russian invasion. Our Ian reports. On Tuesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky made his third visit to Washington since the start of the war in Ukraine 22 months ago. He met with members of Congress as well as President Joe Biden. The visit was Zelensky's in-person plea to save a $61 billion U.S. defense package for war-torn Ukraine. That package has been log-jammed by Republicans on Capitol Hill. 
The Republican members of Congress want the Biden administration to make concessions on U.S. border security and immigration policy in exchange for the aid package. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson said the White House is asking for billions of dollars without a clear strategy for winning the war in Ukraine and that more needs to be done to secure the U.S. homeland borders. What the Biden administration seems to be asking for is billions of additional dollars with no appropriate oversight, no clear strategy to win, and, and none of the answers that I think the American people are owed. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. Prior to his meeting on Capitol Hill, President Zelensky addressed the military audience at the National Defense University on Monday, where he expressed hope that he could still count on the U.S. for assistance. Putin must lose. Must lose so that everyone else who sees Russia's war on Ukraine as, as his personal lecture at the so-called University of Aggression gets the message loud and clear. Putin must lose. His weapon against you right now is propaganda and disinformation. But if he sees a chance, he'll go further. Standing alongside the Ukrainian leader at a White House press conference, President Biden vowed on Tuesday that neither he nor the American people would walk away from Ukraine, saying that allowing a Ukrainian defeat would mean Russian President Vladimir Putin and would-be aggressors everywhere would be emboldened. But there was a subtle but noteworthy shift in public messaging from the president. From his previous statement of a pledge for U.S. support for Ukraine as long as it takes, his message shifted to as long as we can. Speaking to reporters during a meeting with Zelensky in the Oval Office, President Biden announced he would be releasing $200 million in funding that's already been approved by Congress to help Ukraine with its defensive needs. While that's a small fraction of the $60 billion Biden hoped for Ukraine in a supplementary funding request, the $200 million can be released shortly. Yin Jin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, over in the UAE, much frustration continues to be aired by countries at this year's Global Climate Summit as they seek to bridge the gap over the words about the ways to counter climate change. Our Che Suyang explains. The 2023 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP28, which was supposed to close on Tuesday local time, has been extended as the participating countries could not reach an agreement. It's because a new draft released on Monday excluded the key phrase, phase out of fossil fuels. It's important that we have the right language when it comes to fossil fuels. It's important that we think about how we get that balance. The agreement fell because major oil-producing countries, including Saudi Arabia, opposed the words phase out. The Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries urged its 13 member countries to resist fossil fuel withdrawal. But over 100 countries, including the European Union and Australia, as well as many environmental organizations and even small island nations, some of the most vulnerable places in the world of rising temperatures and seas, blasted the draft for lacking the words phase out. And yes, there are a couple of good things in there, but overall it is clearly insufficient and not adequate to addressing the problem uh, we are here to, to address. However, some developing countries also insisted that their countries should not be stopped by the contents of the statement. My country is a developing country. It's landlocked. It's still, you know, you know, exploiting natural resources for the economic development, for livelihood improvement, for job creation and so forth. Two years ago, the conference participants agreed to gradual reduction limited to coal, but failed to expand that to all fossil fuels last year. The summer's director general said the countries need to come back to the objective of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and reducing global emissions by 43 percent. Che Zuhyang, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In Pakistan, a suicide bomber attacked a police compound in the country's northwest city of Dera Ismail Khan, killing at least 23 and injuring 32 on Tuesday. 
Militant group tariq e jihad Pakistan, affiliated to the Pakistani Taliban, claimed responsibility for Tuesday's car bomb attack, saying it was targeting officers at the police compound, which was being used as a base camp for the Pakistani army. The Pakistani army said an hours-long shootout ensued between its security forces and the militants. The statement also said a total of 27 militants were killed after overnight military operations in the area. The Daraban police station is located near Pakistan's border with Afghanistan. A UN agency report released on Tuesday showed that Myanmar is once again the world's biggest opium producer, topping Afghanistan, where the ruling Taliban banned opium production. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes report said that between 2022 and 2023, Myanmar, torn apart by civil war, had an 18 percent increase in the land used for farming of opium to over 47,000 hectares. The opiate economy in Myanmar is estimated to be worth up to 2.5 billion U.S. dollars in 2022, amounting for around 4 percent of the country's GDP. UNODC reported last month that the Taliban's ban on opium production led to a 95 percent drop there. Myanmar has seen turmoil and fighting since the military coup d'etat in February 2021. In Turkey, the president of Turkish Super League side MKE Ankara Guzu, Faruk Koza, was arrested on Tuesday for punching a referee at the end of a match the day before. Koza's team drew with Rizespor on Monday evening after conceding a 97th minute equalizer, prompting him to enter the pitch and physically assault referee Halil Umut Meller. In response, the chairman of the Turkish Football Association announced an indefinite suspension of all league matches, calling the attack a night of shame for Turkish football. The match official suffered a minor fracture after taking several more blows from others as he lay on the pitch. In Bolivia, 12,000 baby turtles have been released into River Itenes a tributary of the Amazon on Monday in an effort by the local government to repopulate the river with the endangered Amazon turtle. The newly hatched turtles found a new home on the border between Bolivia and Brazil. The Amazon turtle's population has been decreasing due to loss of habitat and illegal fishing as well as the trade of the turtle eggs for human consumption. This program in Bolivia has released hundreds of thousands of turtles since it began, and the local communities have developed ecotourism around the turtles. Kim Jiang, Arirang News. Good afternoon. It's hard to believe this mid-December warmth even after days are on the seasonal calendar. The warming trend continues today with warmer highs than yesterday under cloudier skies in most places. Through Friday, we'll have temperatures that are, that are much warmer than norms. Then an extreme cold snap awaits us this weekend, rapidly going down to minus 11 degrees Celsius by Sunday morning here in Seoul. Well, this afternoon, highs are 2 to 5 degrees higher than yesterday. Seoul tops out at 12 degrees Celsius. Very warm on Jeju Island, topping out at 18 degrees Celsius under cloudy skies with decent air quality nationwide. Then rain is in the forecast tomorrow starting from Charlotte and Jeju, spreading nationwide by the afternoon. Well, that rain will continue into Friday, which could come down heavily again like last time. Then freezing air grips much of Korea and we won't see highs above the freezing mark for a while in the capital area. That's Korea for you and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
And those are the headlines at the Sahir in Korea. Coming up next is our daily panel session. Do stay with us. Thank you for now.